Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. It is Tuesday. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal. I hope you are well, whether you are watching or listening to this around the world. Plenty to discuss today. As usual in the world of Arsenal, things keep rumbling on, the stories keep appearing, lots to discuss, lots of talking points. Um, Emil Smith-Rowe, we're certainly going to be talking about him. As you all know, a player I very much rate and would like to see more of at Arsenal. It's being linked with a move away and not just being linked with a move away, but being linked with a move away to Chelsea. So I am certainly going to have my say on that. In today's episode, uh, we'll take a little bit, start to look ahead to the Man United game at the weekend, look at some of the big decisions facing Mikel Arteta. What is he going to do for this game against United? What's he going to do with a starting eleven? Who's he going to leave out? Who's he going to bring in? So we'll look at that and there's talk about there's uh, stuff to talk about with Florin, Florin Balogun as his move to Monaco reaches the very final stages and got lots of comments and questions for you guys as well. OK, let's get going, shall we? And let's talk about Emil Smith-Rowe. Um, as I said, obviously, you all know I'm a big fan of Emil Smith-Rowe. Really like his talents, his qualities. Think he could bring an awful lot to Arsenal. Felt like Mikel Arteta underused him massively in the second half last season when he returned for, for fitness after that knee injury. Um and I was very, very happy when all the work coming out of Arsenal this summer was that he was going nowhere because I was getting pretty worried that he might well be sold this summer. Um, the word from Arsenal, this, obviously, since early on, um, basically, just basically at the end of last season when it finished, was that he wasn't going anywhere. He was still very much part of the plans. And I am, I'm not aware that that's changed, but there's lots of rumours circulating at the moment um, and reports that he has emerged as a possible late target for Chelsea in the transfer window. Um, now, I don't really know where to start with this. I just think, I, I'm not sure there could be a more unpopular decision. I don't know, because I, I've put it out on social media, and actually I'm a little bit surprised by some people being saying, oh, why not, we should sell him if you're not playing, we should sell him. And while there's a slight part of me that can understand that, it's just a fact of selling him where, and so I, I couldn't think of any worse club <laughs> to sell Emil Smith-Rowe to than Chelsea. It would just, for me, it shouldn't even be a conversation that is entertained. And I fully hope that that is the stance that Arsenal would take if Chelsea did indeed come knocking and, you know, pick up the phone and ask about Smith-Rowe between now and Friday's transfer deadline. I would hope that Arsenal would say, not a chance. It's just not happening. Um, whether they would, would remain to be seen. We'll have to wait and see if Chelsea do pick up the phone. But I just think it would be such a horrible, horrible sight Emil Smith Rowe in a Chelsea shirt. I'd hate it for him. I can't see it being a good it would be a good move anyway, because I think he just has to look at the struggles of players who have gone there, the struggles to get game time. You know, he's struggling with game time at Arsenal. I'm not sure he necessarily anything would change should he go to Chelsea. Um and I would hope he wouldn't want to go to Chelsea anyway. But just from an Arsenal point of view, I just don't see why you would entertain that. Now I still think Smith Rowe's got an awful lot to give. And you know, when I look at what's going on with Kai Havertz at the moment and the struggles he's having to really sort of set the world alight since he's arrived at Arsenal. And you look at that position, and I've said it so many times, I honestly think Smith Rowe is tailor made for that position. I think he's got so many qualities where he can really thrive in that in that type of role. And I think what we saw from him in pre-season, when he did get some minutes in pre-season, he looked bright and hungry. And from my understanding of Smith Rowe, um, he has been really, really determined and is really, really determined to force his way into Mikel Arteta's thinking this summer. He's come um this for this season. He's worked really, really hard on his fitness. Um and he's really, really pushing behind the scenes in terms of his data, his training, and he's really working hard to get into the team. Obviously, it hasn't really happened yet so far this season, but there is a lot of games to go. There's lots of competitions to start up. And you would hope that Spin Fro is going to get plenty of opportunities to impress. And we saw with Fabio Vieira at the weekend, if you can take that opportunity, then you can really put yourself at the forefront of everyone's minds. So, yeah, it's not... It's not a story. It's not speculation that sits well with me. I have to say, I just can't see it. And I just can't see it being a good thing for for anyone. Um, you know, I've always had this kind of fear, if that's right, but not fear, just like a understanding really that no one is not for sale. Well, there's a, there's a few people not for sale in this Arsenal team at the moment, but the majority, I would say, although Arsenal would not be wanting to sell certain players, if a really big bid came in for someone, you know, other than a Saka or a Martinelli or a Saliba, you know, that Arsenal would, would probably consider it. And Smith-Rowe's in that list, I would imagine, although they're not 
actively trying to push him out. If so, a really big bid did come in from someone this summer, I always thought you yeah, probably would look at it if it was big enough to turn their heads. But one club I think they should not even consider it to is Chelsea. You know, if it was saying a Villa or I, I don't know, just just that sort of club, then maybe you would think, oh, you know, if they're going to whack down a huge amount of money on the table, we need to bring money in. We struggled to sell other players who we thought we were going to sell. Maybe we would consider it. But for Chelsea, I'd just be like, no, 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 no. It should just be a flout. No. It's not happening. You're not going there. We're not going to consider selling him there. And, um, and yeah, end of story. And I hope that is a stance that Arsenal um, take with Smith Rowe. But let me know what you guys think. It's been interesting. Like I said, I was actually surprised on how many people on Twitter did reply to my tweet and thinking, well, why not just sell him? If we're not going to play him, why not sell him? And while, like I said, you can, I can kind of understand that stance. I think it changes the fact that it's Chelsea that I'm talking about. I just, just no, <laughs> not happening. Don't do it, Edu, Mikel, whoever, don't do it. But let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Um, here's one from Benji. He said, if we somehow end up selling ESR to Chelsea over after overpaying for Habits, my love for the game would go with him. Uh, that's kind of my my feelings about it. So if, to be honest, Benji, I'd be so demoralised if Arsenal sold Smith Rowe. Of all the players that Arsenal have signed from Chelsea unsuccessfully over the years, if they then suddenly just go and turn around and give them Emil Smith Rowe uh, right just before transfer deadline, I think I'd be absolutely distraught. But uh, we shall see. Following Balogun, his move to Monaco now getting very, very close. Is that a, he should be over there today to sort of finalise, put the finishing touches on this move that has been in the pipeline for some time now. Um, you know, going to be drawing a line under this one. Arsenal going to be getting around the sort of 40 million mark, maybe just a little bit less with a big sell-on fee included, which was important. I think you had to protect yourselves by getting either a buyback or a good sell-on fee as part of that deal. And um, I think he'll go there and do really, really well. Obviously, he knows the French League. He's played very well in the French League before. He scored a good amount of goals last season. I see no reason why he's not going to go to Monaco who are a step up from that, playing with better players, why he wouldn't do very, very well. Over there, I think it's just a transfer that had to happen this summer. Arsenal weren't going to use him. He wasn't going to sign a new deal. Only has two years left on that deal. Uh, didn't want to go out on loan again. So what choice do you have, really, as unpopular as is, this move is? And I know with some people it is unpopular. I just think it's a transfer that had to happen. Arsenal had to do it. And I'm happy that he's gone to France. I'd much rather see him go to France and go to England. Obviously, he got a bit better chance of getting more money if he'd gone to one of the English clubs, but I'm not sure I'd really like Balogun turning up in England straight away. I'm sure he'll be back here and he'll be back in the Premier League pretty soon, but um, I'm glad that Arsenal haven't done business with anyone else, any of the sort of rivals and the names that were mentioned of being interested in Balogun. Monaco always felt like the best move for him and for Arsenal. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that this one is now drawing a, we're about to draw a line under it and Arsenal are going to get some money in and it's just really, really important. You know, I know I kind of contradicted myself there by saying don't sell Smith Rowe to Chelsea, but Arsenal do need to bring money in. And I'm aware of that, but there's certain clubs that you just don't, you don't sell players to and you certainly don't sell your best homegrown players to. And for me, uh, Chelsea is, is one of those and that's why I didn't want Balogun to go there and it's why I don't want Emil Smith Rowe to uh, potentially go either. So yeah, good luck to following Balogun. Hope that all goes through as planned in the next sort of 24 hours or so and he can move on, get on with his career. Arsenal can get a nice chunk of money for a player they were going to lose for free just a couple of years ago. Um, it's going to be a club record transfer fee received for Arsenal as well. So uh, yeah, that one is now getting very, very close to completion. Okay, let's turn our attentions a little bit. I know we're still a fair few days away now from the Manchester United game, but there's lots to discuss about United and how Arsenal are going to set out. Uh, obviously, the fallout from Fulham has been pretty brutal, pretty harsh in a way, but also pretty understandable in a way because Arsenal weren't very good and Mikel Arteta made some decisions once again that I think the majority of us all don't agree with and don't really understand when it comes to his starting eleven. Um you know, no matter how many days I think about it, I still don't quite understand why he's doing some of the things he's doing with his starting eleven. And just like you, I feel like Arsenal were pretty disjointed because of it. But they have still got seven points from nine. They are still unbeaten. If they can go and beat Manchester United at a weekend and get 10 points from 12, then you'd sort of look at it and think that's been a pretty decent start to the season. Um, but he does have some big decisions to make. Obviously, Zinchenko coming back in is going to be really, really crucial and it's going to be really interesting. You know, the whole Gabriel story as it continues to rumble on, the one sort of caveat behind it all of what is it just is he just doing it because he doesn't have that left inverted left back that he wants because of Timber's injury? Has that forced him to rethink things? And that's why we've suddenly seen. 
party player at right back. And Gabriel moved out the team because Mikel just wants that proper inverted fullback type position being filled. The plan was to do it with Timber. When Timber got injured, suddenly it had to switch round. Party was the man doing that over on the opposite flank. And that has led to Gabriel being taken out of the team on a temporary basis. That's what we're all kind of looking at and hoping is the case. And when Zinchenko comes back, then that's going to change around again. We're going to see Gabriel come back in. We're probably going to see uh, Ben White move back to right back and Zinchenko will be playing the inverted fullback role over on the left. So we wait to see if that does happen. I do hope it happens, as I said, because I think of all the things Mikel's doing at the moment, I, just the Thomas Party at right back thing, I just do not like it. It doesn't, it takes away Ben White takes away that partnership down the right-hand side with Bukai Saka. I just don't like it. And I really want to see Ben White back at right back. The big question, if that does happen, is what happens with Thomas Partey then? Do you play Thomas Partey in midfield? Do you play Rice and Partey together? I'm not sure Mikel Arteta will do that. I, I have to. I do like that option. I especially like it for away games, really big away games. But I'm not sure at home, even against a team as good as Manchester United, although they've not been great this season. I'm not sure. And so, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting one. If we do go to the more usual defence at the weekend that we've become accustomed to seeing before this season. What do you do with Thomas Partey? Do you play him as a holding role and push um, Declan Rice slightly further forward and play him almost in the Kai Havertz role and take Kai Havertz out of the team? I just don't know if he'll do that, Mikel. I feel like he wouldn't do that. I feel like he'll stick with Declan Rice as a more holding midfielder and then it's going to be, and Thomas Partey might end up being on the bench. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. And then what do you do with Kai Havertz, obviously. Does Havertz stay in the team? Does he continue to keep faith with Kai Havertz trying to play him into form? Or do you take him out of the firing line a little bit when all this criticism is hanging over him and is being directed at him? Personally, I think it's time to take him out of the team, um, give him a bit of a breather, bring him on as a, in a, as a second half substitute. But um, I'm just not sure he's justified keeping that place at the team at the moment especially when you see how Vieira came on. You know, can, lots of people said to me in replies to my comments that he should be rewarded with a starting spot. So now he'll get bullied. It'd be a disaster starting Fabio Vieira against United. I'm not sure about that. I still think that if you're not starting a player because you think he's going to get bullied out of the game, then you've got serious issues with that player and it's just not going to work in the Premier League. And I didn't see him being bullied against Fulham. I saw a player full of initiative who came on and really changed the game and showed a willingness and a hunger to try and change the game. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd have no problems with Fabio Vieira starting on Saturday, on Sunday, given his performance against Fulham. You know, Smith Rowe, could you play him? He's obviously not going to, but he would be an option there um, as well. So there is options to go if you're not going to go with Kai Havertz, um, which I don't think he will. And then, you know, Eddie and Ketia, I think, should absolutely come back into the starting line. Obviously, Gabriel Jesus is back now, but, you know, he's clearly not going to be 100% match fit. He is in a really good um sort of position right now he's scoring goals he's looking dangerous um, he's making good runs yes he missed a couple of chances against Crystal Palace but he's still looking like he's in really good form and in a good way I'm surprised he didn't start against Fulham at the weekend I think he should absolutely start against Manchester United so yeah lots to discuss when it comes to that United game and the team news I can imagine what the reaction is going to be about when the team sheet comes out an hour before kickoff on Sunday there's going to be lots of people disappointed whatever Mikel Arteta does I think um, he just needs to, his team to perform. If Arsenal go out there and perform and um, the starting 11 he picks turns up and puts in a decent performance, then you know not many people are going to be questioning it afterwards. But if they go and, and fail to get a result and fail to sort of just look like the kind of Arsenal team we've come to expect over the last 12 months or so, then he's going to come in for some criticism. It's just the way things are going. But let me know what you guys think in terms of what Mikel should do on Sunday and the big decisions. Gabriel, Havertz, Party, Zinchenko and Ketia. Who should play? Let me know in the comments below. Okay, let's move on to some of your questions and comments then now, shall we? Uh, here's one that from, looks like, Lindy, I think it is, says, I think that sending Tierney out is, uh, on loan is a huge mistake. He's the best left-back Arsenal have on the books. And in terms of his attitude, always giving 100%, he's a model professional. I listen to all this stuff about how injury-prone he is, really, compared to Zinchenko, for example, who hasn't kicked a ball for Arsenal in months and who is fundamentally, fundamentally a midfield player. Defensively, he isn't a patch on Tierney and he's prone to regular carelessness of the sort that contributed to the Fulham equaliser on Saturday. Arteta's tendency to airily ignore the shortcomings of his favourite players is something that's going to need to be addressed and soon or is likely to lead to disharmony and create an us and them climate in which certain players are left in no doubt that they will be given minutes almost irrespective of what they do in terms of performance. Really good 
uh, comment from that one. In a way, I definitely agree with Tierney. I think, I I think, although, yeah, I, it's, it's a tough one because he's just not going to play. And um, so I kind of agree, you know, he's such a good player. Why are you losing such a good player? I can kind of understand it that way. But then I just know he's not going to play because it's just that's Mikel Arteta is not going to play. And whether you agree or disagree with that as an actual decision by the manager, it's a fact so you can disagree with it and think, well, he should be playing. But the fact is, he's not. And so if he's not, then you have to get rid of him, really, because it makes no sense to, for him to be hit, sitting around not getting in a matchday squad. He's too good a player for that. He deserves more than that. So I think he should go from that regard. But, you know, in a, you know, in a parallel universe, if you've got a manager who actually rates Kieran Tierney, then he certainly shouldn't go because he's good enough to play for Arsenal. No doubt about it. He's one of the best left backs in England, I think. And so I absolutely agree with you. He's just a left back that Mikel doesn't really want those attributes in his team right now um so yeah it's, a, it's an interesting one but I think Arsenal have lost an excellent player they've lost a real leader they've lost a popular player within the squad and I would have been using him 100% I'd have been using him I thought you know every time he came on in pre-season I thought he played very very well but then the fact he did that and then the next game he was still not in the team and he was still being overlooked for a player who was you know basically a right back or a centre back then it just tells its own story and when that's happening then you may as well just go um, because you're not going to play. Um, but I agree. And I think, you know, when you talk about Arteta's tendency to already ignore the shortcomings of favourite players and needs to be addressed, it, see, that sort of thing, I talk about that in a book, actually, that's coming out, you know, a big criticism of Arteta or the, you know, people that I speak to who have worked, you know, in and around him and know people who work with him is that you can be, you can feel like you've been left out in the cold a little bit. If you're not on that, in that inner circle, you know, all of a sudden you, you feel like you don't really know why you're not playing and you don't really get, that good an explanation as why you're not playing and it's something that you know people that I've spoken to says that he does need to work on and you know he's a young coach whether he even cares about that I don't know maybe he doesn't but um you know it is a, a criticism that has been leveled at him before and I think will be continue to be leveled at him at times because it does feel like if you are not really in that group that he really trusts and believes in then you can kind of feel like you're very much out in the cold and on the outside of things and um you know that doesn't always breed the best of um, atmospheres at a training ground uh, but you know I suppose then on another hand you can look at it and say well last season Arsenal had this amazing atmosphere at the training ground they were, you know everyone loved being there and, um, and that's why he wants to work with a relatively small squad not a tiny squad but a relatively small squad because he wants people who stay involved so yeah thanks very much for your question there Here's one from 14 Wiltshire says is the fan reaction due to our overachievement last season and now that we spent 200 million they expect our start to be at least good or at least as good. I think it's very hard. If you're expecting Arsenal start to be at least as good as last season, I think that's really, really difficult because they won, what, nine out of the first 10 Premier League games? That just doesn't happen. There's a reason that was Arsenal's best start in whatever many years it was because it just doesn't normally happen. So it's, I don't think you can look at the start they had last season and say, right, you've got to be as good as that. You've got to get as many points as that because it's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Um, you know, last season was a one-off in the way Arsenal started that season. You know, they got to Christmas, they were 50 points at Christmas. It was a record. And um, you can't maintain that. It's just no matter who you sign, how much money you spend, it's still, that's still a pretty much a one-off first half of the season. Um, and so that's why I think it's really difficult to continuously compare results and everything like that to last season, because last season was such a one-off up to the World Cup. It was a remarkable start to the season from Arsenal and um, so I think you've got to sort of take a step back sometimes and kind of put last season to one side and realise this is a new season it's going to be completely different other teams are going to be better it's going to be harder to get points um, we've just got to see how Arsenal get on look at Manchester City they were so close to dropping points against Sheffield United at the weekend so close they didn't because they're City and they managed to get themselves over line but you know they're one minute away basically um, almost you know, 80 was it 89th minute Rodri's winner so um, yeah I think we've got to you just got to sort of take a little bit of a step back from last season a little bit, I think. And um, I think the fan reaction to this start of the season is not so much about results because you can't really look at seven points from nine and think that's a terrible start of season. It's not. It's more just the the sort of stop-start nature of the performances and more specifically, probably just Mikel Arteta's team selections. I think that's what's confusing most people and leaving people a little bit bemused about what's going on is and really understand what he's trying to do. And, you know, I absolutely agree with that because I'm in the same camp. Um, this is on uh, Thomas Party and Gabrielle and everything like that. There's a couple of uh, sort of comments here that are grouped in together. Carsten says, Mikel Arteta was, uh, wanted one inverted fullback. That's why Party plays there. No one else 
can with Zinchenko and just and Julian Timber out. He doesn't want Gabriel in the centre of a three in the back, which he will if the three moved right and I um, instead of left with uh, when Alexander Zinchenko plays. He is not safe on the ball as Saliba is. That's why Gabriel doesn't play the Timber injury. Forced party to be inverted right back now and not in pre-season. It's a good comment. You know, had Timber stayed fit um, and not got injured, would we have seen party at right back? Probably, I agree with you, that might not have been the case. So Timber's injury, I think, certainly has had a big impact on how Arsenal are setting up this season. And here's one from King's Slime 66 below. says, Charles, do you not think that Big Gabby might be playing? Uh, might not be playing because we haven't had a left back to invert with Zinni and Timber being out yet. And that's what I was talking about. With Zinchenko back fit now, and I'm pretty sure he'll start against United with another week's worth of training under his belt, providing he doesn't have some sort of setback. That, you know, it's going to be the really big litmus test, isn't it, in terms of Gabriel? And does he come back into the team? If Zinchenko starts at left back against United and Gabriel still doesn't start and Party's still over on the right, you know, then I think the serious big questions will be being asked at that point. Um, so, yeah, I think Sunday's going to be really, really interesting from that regard. All right, and that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. We are only two days away now from the big book launch at the Tollington, so please do get down there on Thursday. If you are in and around the London area, it should be a very good night. As, as you can see, doors open at 4 p.m. Books will be on sale there. I'll be signing them from 5.15. Then it'll be the big Q&A. There's plenty to talk about. I'm sure lots of people in the audience uh, will have lots to say about what's going on at Arsenal at the moment and who's playing and who's not playing and things like that. So it should be a really fun night. It's going to be me, Gunner Blog, Sam Dean from The Telegraph, all down there as part of the panel during this Q&A. So please do um, come and join in that event. You can see there, if you're watching this on screen on the right as well, I've had lots of questions about people wanting a sign to get a signed copy of the book. How can you do it? Well, Goldsboro Books in Covent Garden have got an exclusive batch of signed copies or will have. I'm going in there uh, later on this week to sign a whole load of them and they will be selling them exclusively while stocks do last. Now, I'll put the link to that in the description below, you can get do a normal pre-order link from Amazon or whatever. But if you look below for the Goldsboro book one as well, that's the one where you can order that, pre-order that, and uh, you will then be able to get a signed copy sent to you through the post while stocks last. All right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Do have a very good Tuesday. I'll be back tomorrow to talk all things Arsenal once again. A bit later on, actually, probably going to be close around lunchtime because I'm on Sky Sports News in the morning. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I think about 8.30 a.m. I'm due to be on Sky Sports News talking about Arteta, the book Arsenal. So please do tune on to Sky Sports tomorrow morning if you want to watch me uh, and listen to me once again talk about all things Arsenal. Have a great day, everyone. I'll speak to you very, very soon.